When it comes to combat in the Fallout games, the player has a variety of weapons at their disposal that they can use to engage enemies in a multitude of ways. This includes explosives, melee weapons, and of course, guns. While all these options are of course good to have, the player is not entirely defenceless should they have no weapons, as they can swing their arms wildly at anyone unfortunate enough to come close. That said, in most situations you would much rather have a weapon to defend yourself. Today however is not one of those situations, as today we aim to find out, can you beat Fallout 4 with only your fists? And when I say only fists, I mean only fists. We ain't gonna be relying on knuckle dusters or power fists in this playthrough. So with that out of the way, let's begin. Nothing crazy for the character this time, this is pretty much how all my characters look if I'm doing a casual playthrough if the game has a character creator. Once we have control, I immediately wait on top of the radio and glare at the vault tech rep as I patiently await his arrival. For my special stats, I just assign what I normally would for a melee focus build, so for me that is 10 in strength, 9 endurance, and then the rest goes into agility, so it is left with 5 points. Strength is fairly obvious why, and endurance is for both the added hit points and for the ability to sprint for longer, which is a feature that is new to the Fallout franchise for this game. The points in agility are more for action points as you need them to sprint and to do power attacks in this game, unlike in 3 in New Vegas. If you have played New Vegas, you know where I got the name from. Everything is peaceful for once in a Fallout game. That is until New York and Pennsylvania are wiped off the face of the earth and it was time to turn my family into cavemen. Well, that's if they can keep up, as thanks to my endurance, I just take off like a bat out of hell as soon as the doors open, wife and child be damned. Somehow though, they did manage to make it inside with me and now we can all become frozen TV dinners together. Well, my wife dies. That's nice. For what it's worth, I am punching the glass here, so technically the run is already off to a great start. One great thing about this run is since I wake up with both of my hands still attached to my body, I don't have to worry about avoiding enemies and can instead start squishing the bugs. I also stop to make sure that the difficulty is on normal, which it is, so we're all good for now. I ignore the security baton and the pistol because if I pick them up the game will automatically equip them since I don't have a pit boy yet, and I'm not sure if I can use the hotkey menu to unequip them so it really isn't worth the hassle. Well, since rad roaches have literally never been an issue in any fallout I make it to the pit boy with ease and escape the vault. Once outside, I completely ignore Codsworth and Sanctuary and head straight for Concord to begin gauging how well my fists hold up in a real fight against people with weapons. Fighting the raiders outside goes very well, as I can take them all out with about two hits each. I should also mention that most of the combat will be done in third person for this run, because for some reason if you use your fists in third person, you get access to a bunch of special moves that you just aren't able to use in first person. These aren't also just like different kill move animations, but are actually useful moves such as tripping up opponents, as well as a throw that actually does pretty decent damage and briefly knocks enemies down. For anyone who may want to try this run, I find the most consistent way to get these moves to work is to throw a normal punch and then double tap whatever your heavy attack button is. In my case, it's the right bumper on my Xbox controller. Right before I enter the museum to help Preston, I level up and take the Iron Fist perk for a 20% increase to all unarmed attacks. Which if you couldn't guess, completely trivialises the rest of the already easy to kill raiders that are harassing the Minutemen. Now it was time for the Deathclaw fight. I took the suit of power armor just so I could survive taking a single hit, but rest assured I only used my fists to deal with the raiders and even the Deathclaw. I know for a fact that a large number of people actually fought the Deathclaw with their fists in their first playthrough, as I am one of those people, so I know it is more than doable. If any of you also fought him with your fists in your first playthrough, let me know in the comments. Well, with the Deathclaw taken care of, I easily mop up the last of the raiders, the highlight of which was when I bought this one's head right off. Before heading back to Sanctuary to start the Minutemen's questline, I run down the road to deal with Wolfgang to get a reward from Trudy. I then buy some supplies from her and then promptly finish off her and her son before ransacking the place of everything that isn't nailed down because this is Fallout 4. I also know if I don't start gathering junk now, I'm going to regret it near the end of the game when I need to try and build a teleporter. Now that I am finished with my little bout of murder, I head to Sanctuary and help get the place into some sort of livable condition, just to make some easy XP as from my own personal experience. Levels and perks are pretty important in Fallout 4 if I want to make things easier on myself since you don't increase skills individually anymore like in the old games. It was around this point that I decided I would try siding with the Minutemen as that is something I've never actually tried before and I thought it might be fun. So rather than make my way straight to Diamond City, I instead had to help out the settlers at Dampines Bluff who claim they are being attacked by raiders, even though these raiders are a fair distance away from here, but whatever. This was also when I decided that cooking would actually be a good idea for this run, because as things currently stand, I don't have a whole lot of stim packs, so some cooked food will definitely help out if I'm in a pinch. Once I make my way to the plant where the raiders are, I almost immediately get ripped to shreds by this turret. This is because, as you can all probably imagine, having to get up close and punch what is essentially a living gun tends to get you stuck in the line of fire. Lucky for me though, they aren't all that armoured, so a few slaps and it explodes in my face. Which thankfully doesn't actually seem to damage me at all, which is a relief. 
Since we are still the very early stages of the game, the raiders here don't pose any challenge. Even their leader goes down in 3 hits. The only time I ever died here was when I wasn't paying attention to how much damage these two turrets were doing to me. To make me feel better, I did get this amazing kill when I knocked this raider off of the top of the plant. With the raiders at the Corvega plant dealt with, I returned to Preston and get to work bringing two more settlements into our cult. The first one just had me kill a few ghouls, which takes less than two minutes, and then the second had me go clear out more raiders while also looking for a locket for Mr. Abernathy here. The raider leader here could have been trouble, but I came prepared by huffing some matrix fumes, which slowed down time enough for me to make my way in for the kill. With that out of the way, it was already time for us to retake the castle. That said, however, I am probably not ready to take on a family of Mirelurks just yet, so instead I decided to refocus back on the plot for now and begin making my way to Diamond City. On the way there, I bump into this fellow named Timothy. Uh, I smell a robot. <laughs> One final distraction before entering the city, I decided to try my luck at fighting super mutants. Turns out, like most people with organs, if you just stand behind them and repeatedly punch them in the kidneys, they will eventually keel over and stop moving. Not wanting to sit through what is essentially an unskippable cutscene, I punched Piper in the jaw, causing the doors to open and saving myself some time. Now that I have finally got to Diamond City, I stock up on some medical supplies and then talk to Ellie to get Nick's location. I am aware that just like Benny in New Vegas, I could have technically just went straight to where Nick is and start the story from there, but truth be told, I completely forgot where that was. On my way there, I took a few more raiders for a whirl before getting a pool cue stabbed straight through my brain, which was only slightly demoralising. Next time around, I hit up some Psycho and things go a lot smoother. So much smoother, in fact, that I also murdered a few nearby scavengers just because they were in knuckle range. Despite this newfound strength, I would soon be put back in my place when I thought I had a chance of taking on Swan. Spoiler alert, I was never going to stand a chance. No matter, no one escapes my wrath, I shall be back for him later. The trigger men inside Park Street Station actually surprised me by how much tougher they were than the raiders I'd encountered up to this point. Health-wise, they're about the same, but their submachine guns and 10mm pistols were pretty effective against me, and they could have easily killed me if I wasn't careful. The only reason I didn't immediately get turned into Swiss cheese was due to all the cooked food I had mentioned earlier, as I was able to just about offset the damage with it as I made my way around taking down each trigger man. It was also here where I started using VATS a lot more, as the criticals I could build up were a huge help. I do kind of wish I'd put some points into luck though, so I could get more frequent use out of this. Regardless, once I dealt with them, I hit level 9 and was able to get the second point in the Iron Fist perk, which gives me a chance to disarm enemies with each punch. This proved to be incredibly useful for dealing with enemies that had either melee weapons or shotguns. Once inside the vault, things got a lot simpler, because, as you can probably all imagine, I tend to excel in close quarters situations. Once I met up with Nick and we made our way out, I once again used the power of drugs to easily and efficiently beat Skinny Malone and his cronies to a pulp. I would also like to point out that Nick's comments on the current situation would imply that I quite literally punched holes through Skinny Malone's torso, and that is what I now choose to believe is my headcanon. I send Nick back to Diamond City as I want to hang around for a little while, you know? Smell the air, take in the sights, talk to the locals, completely exterminate anyone slash everyone the railroad has ever loved and cared about with ruthless efficiency. On my return journey from my casual jaunt through Murder Town, I had possibly one of the longest fist fights I've ever had in a game whenever I disarmed a super mutant butcher. I'm not sure if I was just weak or he had a ton of health or just some mix of the two, but it lasted a while. Sadly for him, however, by the time he realised that this was a fight he wasn't going to win, it was far too late for him and with one final smack I claimed victory. Something that did occur to me was that if it took me this long to take down one butcher, how bad would Kellogg be when I had to face him? With that in mind, I once again put the story on hold and visited the Colonial Tap House so I could begin the Diamond City Blues quest. After we deal with Cook, the owner of this fine establishment, we can take a note of his body that informs us of a drug deal that's going down. As you've probably figured out, I am not here to do the quest for the sake of experience, I am doing it for the sheer number of drugs we can obtain from it. But more on that in a bit, because since I'm already in Diamond City, I steal the key to Kellogg's house from the mayor's receptionist, and then me and Nick go to investigate. Thankfully I remember exactly what I have to do in here so I don't have to waste too much time. This is also the first time I've got this dialogue with Nick because like most players I have usually already encountered dogmeat by now. Well, since I apparently can't stay focused on any one thing for more than a few seconds, I also decided that I would go mark Fort Hagen on the map now. For some reason. Like, I'm looking back on the footage and I don't know what was going through my head here. Like, just why? What is the point in marking it on the map now, to then just travel away to do the drug bust and then immediately come back? Wouldn't it just make more sense to do the drug bust first? <laughs> My degrading brain functionality aside, I did have a brief fight with some raiders, one of which was in a suit of power armour. He honestly wasn't as tough as I thought he'd be, but what's even more impressive is how far I knocked him away without final punch. Like a goddamn Fisto. So, once I made it to Fort Hagen, I then went and busted the drug deal, and for those of you who don't know, from this you get exactly 50 jet, 50 mentats, 50 psycho, and 50 buff out. Or in other words, more than enough drugs to do for the rest of the game. 
Now with currently enough drugs on me to make even Pablo Escobar blush, I head back to Fort Hagen and begin making my way to Kellogg. I was prepared for the synths to be more of a pain. This is mainly because I just assumed that the takedown moves I mentioned near the beginning wouldn't work on them. But to my surprise, they do! So with a few doses of Jet and Psycho, I was more than able to make my way through them with little resistance. Now, as for Kellogg? Well, how about I just show you the full fight? So, as you all just witnessed with the footage, he was a complete and utter pushover and I was literally worried about nothing. That said, I'm not going to complain about being overprepared for a change. When we get outside, the Brotherhood arrives in their massive airship, which is wasting my time as I'm not allowed to fast travel until after their little speech is over. If I wasn't siding with the Minutemen, then that thing would be going down like the Hindenburg. Once I am allowed to fast travel, however, I make my way back to Diamond City and tell Nick that I'll meet him in Good Neighbor. But not before helping Preston retake the castle. I had figured by now I had more than enough points in offensive and defensive perks that I could probably deal with the Mirelurks. I was partially correct. Punching them normally wasn't really doing a great amount of damage, probably due to me hitting their shells, but whenever I targeted them in vats, things would go a lot better. I'm going to assume this is because I'm targeting their underbelly where they are quite weak. Preston and the Minutemen did help out a decent amount here as well. That all being said, anyone who's played this before knows what's coming next. After we deal with the Mirelurks, me and Preston begin scrambling some eggs, which, as you can probably imagine, angers the creature who laid said eggs. Shocking probably none of you, I barely tickle the queen crab with my punches. I do surprise myself with the fact that I don't get insta-killed the moment she steps on me. The best plan of attack I could come up with was pumping myself full of drugs and then immediately using vats to build up the crit meter on her. And then once it was full, use the critical strike and then retreat inside the castle where she couldn't reach me until Preston got her attention and my action points refilled and would then repeat the process. It was a fairly long process, but it was getting results. I just had to make sure I wasn't too reckless and lost my head. About 10 minutes of this and I was able to land the last punch, which for some reason sent her up into the air and I could claim victory over the ocean. Best of all, however, was I got 5 slices of Queen Mirelurk meat, which for me at this moment will completely refill my health. They're also better than stim packs, because there's no animation that needs to finish before the healing's actually applied. With the cast of the Little Mermaid's corpses still fresh on the soil, I help Preston set up the Freedom Radio, and once that's done, I make my way to Good Neighbor to have a look-see inside the piece of Kellogg's brain that is probably stuck under my wedding ring. Nothing to talk about in the memory sequences, as you don't even have to listen to them, as you can just run past all of them except the last one, as it's the only one that's actually even remotely important to us. Next up is making our way through the Glowing Sea, which is probably one of the coolest environments to explore in Fallout 4 in my opinion, just because of how different it is to the rest of the map. I did have a short fist fight with a Raz Scorpion that went rather well on my part. If you think that means I stopped to fight everything on my way to Virgil, you would be mistaken, as I just made a beeline straight for his cave, as I'm doing rather well for myself, but I didn't want to burn through all of my stim packs trying to fight a Deathclaw that swallowed a bag of glow sticks. Once we meet up with the ogre, we are meant to travel to the CIT ruins and follow a signal to find a courser, so we can kill him and decode his special chip to help us get inside the institute. However, seeing how I have beaten this game before, I know that the courser is at Green Tech Genetics, so I can just head straight there to save myself some pointless wandering. By this point, basic human enemies like raiders and gunners pose very little threat, especially in close quarters, so I'll skip ahead to the fight with the courser. The courser fight is really no different than the Kellogg fight, as he employs the same tactics of using stealth boys and stim packs when his health is low. In fact, if you can believe it, I would say Kellogg is technically more difficult, if only slightly, as at least he had two sins for backup, the Courser is all by himself, so therefore once I manage to stunlock him or trip him over, the fight is basically over. Now, since I sent the railroad to an early grave already, I can just mosey on back to the old north church and decode the chip myself. I'm not actually sure if this saved me any time, as I can't remember if I needed to do work for them before I could decode it. I suppose that's something I'll figure out when I side with the railroad for one of these challenges. With the plans to now build a teleporter ready to go, I head back to Sanctuary to enlist the aid of the Minutemen. I'm told to talk to Sturges to help me build the device, and for a moment I had trouble finding him. This was because the man had somehow got himself stuck on the roof. Well, after I built a ladder to get him down from there, like some sort of stray cat in a tree, I got him to help me so that I could break into his old house. Oh, here's a bit of trivia. For anyone who isn't aware, Sturges is actually a synth. As far as I know, there's nothing in the game that actually hints towards this, but if you use console commands to kill him on the PC version, he has a synth component on his person. Upon arriving in the Institute, I waste no time and murder Father immediately before he has a chance to explain himself. Oddly enough, he seems rather intrigued by the idea. Fascinating. With their dear leader now dead, the entirety of the Institute now wants my head. 
Luckily, I came prepared for this and used a stealth boy to sneak by the majority of synths until I was at the final stretch and then just ran for the teleport out of there. After spending less than 5 minutes in the institute, my guy apparently has all the information he could need and decides that blowing them up is the best answer. That said, before we can do that, I have a few more missions for the Minutemen to finish off. First on our list is getting the artillery schematics at the castle for Ronnie Shaw. Nothing too difficult here other than having to deal with this sentry bot in the basement. Thankfully he is too thin to fit through the doorway, so I just used the same strategy I did earlier on the Mirelurk Queen to make the fight go as smooth as possible. Once he's out of the way, we get the schematics and build the artillery. I throw a smoke grenade, and then throw another because I'm bad at following instructions, and then head back to Ronnie to finish off this quest. Next up is everyone's favourite part of Fallout 4, Radiant Settlement Quests. How fun. First mission is to help out these two people at Overland Station. Don't know if I would call two people living in a half destroyed house a settlement, but whatever. All they need me to do is take out a few nearby raiders, so nothing too fancy. Actually, they only require me to take out the raider leader, so it's a fairly easy and straightforward mission. Once that's over with, I do almost the exact same mission for the settlers at Greentop Nursery, only replace raider in the previous sentence with super mutant. It also goes by without a hitch. This is mainly because super mutants seem to stagger rather easily for some reason. That's two settlements down and only one to go. The final settlement requires me to once again, you guessed it, take out some raiders that are bothering them. Well, that isn't entirely true, the man actually just wants his flame sword back, and honestly, can't say I blame him, it's a pretty cool sword. These particular band of goons are actually called The Forged. All that means is they wear slightly better armour than your normal raiders, and some of them carry flamethrowers. The ones with flamethrowers do actually hurt a decent amount, but thanks to my ability that gives me a chance to disarm whoever I'm attacking, they aren't too bad if I'm careful. The real challenge comes when I make my way to the end of the quest, as the leader of the forged, Slag, is in a suit of power armour and takes barely any damage from my attacks. I do manage to disarm him, twice, which makes the fight a lot easier, but then right when I was about to finish him off, he decided to just crap out a fusion core, the resulting explosion in which killed us both, causing me to start the fight over. Next time around, I make sure to deal with all of his minions first and then focus him down again, much like last time, all the while being wary of his explosive eggs. When he does decide to try that trick again, I am ready for it and immediately run as far as I could and thankfully manage to avoid the blast this time. Turns out though that that was the best thing that could have happened as he only had one fusion core, so pretty much as soon as he dropped it, he was forced to get out of his power armour. When this happened, I became the Obi-Wan to his Anakin and left him to burn to death for his mistakes while I returned the sword to the Finches. He actually let me keep the sword. Not that that means a whole lot in this playthrough, but it's the thought that counts I suppose. With Finch Farm now a part of the Minutemen, I could begin the last stretch of the game, which starts by me having to defend the castle from an absolute army of synths and coursers. This was actually a pretty tough fight, but thankfully I came prepared by having a firing squad of turrets parked right at the main entrance. This meant that whenever more than one synth was attacking me at a time, I could theoretically run outside the castle walls, and when they tried to follow me, they would be ripped to shreds by the turrets. Other than that, the only weird thing that happened was when a bunch of synths with no arms began charging us from the rear. Are they meant to have arms? Because I'm honestly not too sure. <laughs> With the castle now safe, the only thing left to do is to make our way back to the institute for the final mission. Turns out that is as simple as just swimming up through the sewer pipes near the CIT ruins, which is certainly a huge security oversight on their part. Like, I know there are synths and turrets down there, but you would think that the place would be on high alert at all times, just in case. Anyway, I digress, I do have a little trouble with the turrets, mainly because some of them are out of reach, but I am able to run past them and deal with a few synths before crawling through one last pipe and using the terminal here to teleport my allies in. Thanks to the added help of Preston and his freedom friends, making my way through the synths is a breeze. It's not so much that they're doing a lot of damage, but more so they act as pretty good distractions while I do most of the work. I did fist fight a gorilla at one point in one. Let that speak for how strong my guy must be by this point. Once we cleared the main room, it was my job to go override the lockdown. On the way there, I found that Father was still right where I left him. So, seeing as no one else had the decency to clear out the rubbish, I took him up to the bed where he would normally die and tried my best to place him in it in a way that would just make it look like he was nabbing. Once that little distraction was out of the way, I made my way down to the reactor core and just immediately strapped the pulse generator on the reactor. I actually forgot that this would teleport me out almost instantly, which is a shame as I really wanted to fight the legendary synth. Oh well. I leave the robot child with the messed up eyes to die in the explosion and then press the detonator and blow up the institute, finishing the game and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 4 with only your fists. Now while that is the main story over with, there was one teeny tiny little thing I wanted to do. You all thought I forgot about it, but I didn't. I went back for my rematch with Swan. It was a tough fight. He has a decent amount of health and can do a lot of damage to us, especially at close range. But, unbeknownst to him, I still had plenty of healing items and psycho left, so I was ready to outlast this war of attrition. After nearly 5 straight minutes of punching him in the knees, I was able to claim victory, and now I could officially claim that the challenge was over. I hope all of you who voted for this run were happy with how it turned out, as it was actually a lot of fun. 
And as for next week, it'll be the Fallout 4 with only gun bashing video, so I hope you all look forward to seeing that one as well. Regardless, that's going to be the end of this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like, and if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe as I try to have one of these videos out every week. My name's Nurbit, stay safe everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.